Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, so uh, welcome to the last webinar in the Livestock Webinar Series. That's all, it's going to be all about parasite controlling cattle. Um, so this is going to be recorded. If you need to watch it later, it'll be posted to YouTube. Um, probably first thing in the morning, I'll send that out as well as the handouts folder. And then um, a short evaluation that I would really appreciate if you can could complete um, that feedback is very helpful to um, to us and to what we're trying to do with our programming so um, I would really appreciate it all right so let's get going here um, so this is kind of what we're gonna go over tonight I'm gonna talk about the parasite cycle internal parasites some deworming strategies then we're gonna switch gears and talk about external parasites and control and then I do have some research studies um, that were done in North Carolina that I'll share with you. They're getting a little old now, but I still think they're very relevant, um, especially off of the, uh, some of the research I looked at recently. So, okay, so if you are not familiar with how the parasite life cycle works, this is a great little diagram just so that you understand, uh, you know, why we do what we do, why we recommend what we recommend to break up that cycle. So all animals that are out on pasture can be infected with internal parasites. The only way you can have total control is in like a dry lot type of situation with no vegetation. Uh, so if they're out grazing, what they're gonna do is they're going to pick up that L3 uh, larva and they're going to ingest that and it's going to then um, migrate into the gut. The worms are going to mature and um, they're going to become adults and then they're going to lay eggs there. And then the eggs are then shed out um, the back end of the animal back out into the environment and they're going to live out in that environment until they're picked back up again. And a lot depends on the weather uh, as to how long they can live out in the environment. When it's really hot and dry, um, there's a really low chance of reinfestation. But when it's nice and warm and moist, and sometimes in North Carolina, if we have mild winters, they can hang out in the environment for a really long time. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of an overview with that. Okay, so as far as what type of internal parasites affect cattle, we have roundworms. There's three different ones uh, that I'm going to talk about tonight. And there's liver flukes. You'll see that if you research internal parasites with cattle, you'll see that. For our area, North Carolina, it's really an issue. If you're in other parts of the country, it is definitely an issue in other parts of the country. Tapeworms. Um, tapeworms are definitely out there. They're not in my opinion, a huge concern, but it's something to be aware of. Um, and you definitely want to, you know, try to gain some control over that. And then coccidia. Coccidia probably cost uh, the beef cattle industry more money than any other type of internal parasite. And it's actually a protozoa type of um, parasite. Okay, so let's talk about roundworms uh, or nematodes that are found year round in cattle. They can live in many sites within the cow. So the lungs, the body cavity, um, the tear or lacrimal ducts beneath the skin, and of course in the GI tract. The cattle can host over 14 different species of gastrointestinal roundworms. Uh, the brown stomach worm, so I don't even want to try to uh, pronounce <laughs> the name of it, but it's Ostertagia um, is, my, is my best guess out of how to pronounce it, but it's known as the brown stomach worm. This uh, does affect cattle less than two years. That's, that's the class of cattle it's going to affect most. It is uh, most economically important. It feeds on the stomach lining. It interferes with digestion. So if you think about what these worms are doing inside the animal, they're robbing that animal of nutrients. So if you're not deworming animals, they, you know, if you're, if, even if you're feeding them really, really well, or you're grazing them well, um, if they've got a parasite load, they're being robbed of all those nutrients. And that's how an animal can still go downhill and can still die from an internal parasite load. 
Um, the problem with some of these is they can hibernate. Uh, so some of them can hibernate in the abomasum and it can hang out as long as it wants and all of a sudden it's gonna you know appear so um, or become active if you will um, the emergence of larva so deworming diet change and climate change uh, will help it looks like activate it for this particular type the homonchus worm, or known as the barber pole worm, this is mainly an issue in goats and sheep. It's like the number one issue in goats and sheep. It can be found in cattle, but it's rarely, rarely an issue in cattle, and it's going to be a different type. So what affects goats and sheep is not going to affect cattle, um, if that makes any sense. So that's why co-grazing different species of um, livestock works really well. So if you've got goats and sheep and you, you have a, a pretty big parasite problem, which almost everybody does, if you throw some cows in there or some horses, different, a different class of livestock, um, they can kind of vacuum up those parasite eggs that would bother the other class of animals. So that's why that works really well. But um, with the barber pole worm, there is a lot of resistance there. They shed out high egg numbers um, or they produce high egg numbers. They're a blood feeder. So these animals become anemic and, and die. That's how um, it's just, it's an attack on their entire system. Uh, can persist for long periods of time, especially in the environment. Um, and Famancha was developed for goats and sheep to identify this. So this is this card that you see here. We don't have any system like that for beef cattle. Um, but again, it's really an issue for cattle. Just wanted to make everybody aware of it though. Um, so Cuperia um, is the most prevalent parasite in the U.S. cow-calf operations. Um, it is found in the small intestines, and this one again is for young cattle, cattle three years or um, and younger. They're the most affected. They're the latest study, and um, I don't know if there's anyone newer than this one, but the last time I gave this presentation, that was the latest study. So this study demonstrated that Cuperia um, punctata <laughs> has a significant effect on cattle productivity, both reduced to weight gain, decreased feed intake compared to controls. Again, you're gonna see a couple of different things of cattle have internal parasites. Um, they're going to, even though if they're eating, they're gonna be losing weight. They're, they might have a rough hair coat, they might have diarrhea. Uh, they're just gonna act off like they don't feel good. Um, so you're gonna know something's going on with them. But I would say the biggest one is just loss of productivity. So that the weight issue and then um, the decreased feed intake and things that you don't necessarily see that can occur, especially on brood cows is they, um, you know, they might not produce as much milk if they have a parasite load. Um, and then in calves, of course, it directly relates to growth and weight gain. And that's how you get paid if you're a cow-calf producer. So um, we'll talk about that, uh, some studies that do some comparisons on how much weight an animal can gain if it, if it has been dewormed. Okay, so tapeworms, again, like I had mentioned, they're considered minimal. They're out there. You need to be aware of it. They do live in the intestinal tract. The intermediate host is a forage mite, and uh, your white dewormers will take care of tapeworms, so the albendazole and the fembendazole, uh, products like Safeguard. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about coccidia. It is a parasitic disease. The estimation, this is probably a lot higher now actually, it's around 100 million economic impact to cattle industry each year. So again, like I mentioned, it's protozoa parasites. They're, they are very host specific. So if you've heard of coccidia before, you may have heard about it in chickens or sheep or goats or something like that. Um, it does occur in almost all classes of livestock. Um, but it is going to be species specific, just like any other type of parasite. Um, it's highly resistant. It can survive for years. It's transmitted from animal to animal through fecal oral route. And the symptoms for coccidia are going to be pretty similar to um, the in other internal parasites I talked about. So that's why it's really critical that you have a vet diagnosed before treatment because you could think that it's, uh, you know, just regular internal parasites and not coccidia. 
and you could deworm, you could spend a bunch of money doing that and it's not doing anything for the animal because it actually needs a different type of treatment. So symptoms are gonna be acute diarrhea with or without blood, straining, severe weight loss and death. The animal just looks horrible. It has been a long time since I've had a calf get coccidia, knock on wood. And again, we thought it was an internal parasite issue. And um, then we started working with our vet and had some fecals ran. Um, and that's what I highly recommend if you've got like, you know, any particular case where, you know, you have a good deworming program, um, you're doing rotational grazing, you're doing everything you're doing, and you still have a calf that's just off, something's wrong with it. Um, definitely consult with your veterinarian and work with them, have a fecal ran um, and start working on what's going on with that animal. But have a vet uh, diagnose it before treatment because if you just, um, you know, if you treat an animal for coccidia that has internal parasites, you're missing the boat. I mean, hopefully y'all get my drift here. You definitely want to know what you're treating for before you spend the money and time on the wrong treatment because these two things can look a lot alike. Um, so controlling coccidiosis, uh, the bad news is all cattle have coccidia. Um, the good news is, you know, there are ways to put control measures in place if you're kind of a high risk situation, like a stalker, a background, or you're buying and selling cattle, things like that. Um, so with cattle all having coccidia, the most affected are going to be newborns and calves at weaning um, when stress is induced. So it's very stressful being born. Um, if they're being born into a um, very stressful environment, like it's really muddy, it's super cold, or it's super hot, you know, just anything just really stressful in addition to being born, that can help, um, you know, that can bring out coccidia. And then weaning calves is another huge one that can bring out uh, coccidia. I usually tell folks if you can minimize what you do at weaning time and you just wean them or you have a two-step weaning process or you can do fence line weaning, there's lots of strategies for weaning um, to be able to keep things um, as low stress as possible, but just in general, it's a stressful time for them. You can use a coccidia stat. So rumensin um, is one of them. It's a prevention and control of coccidiosis. It's a feed through ingredient for cattle on pasture. Um, and so it's often added to rations fed to cattle at weaning time. It's very low cost. So if you are weaning calves and putting them in, um, you know, more of a confinement area or just it's going to be more of a high stress situation or you're a stalker background or receiving cattle that have been trailered or that sort of thing. Um, you know, that would be a more stressful type situation. Um, so as a reminder, if everybody will stay muted with your video cameras off, that would be super helpful. And again, you can also talk to your veterinarian about this as well for a plan for controlling coccidiosis. If you have a history of it on your farm, again, or just very stressful or particular type of situations, I would say the regular everyday cow-calf producer does not use a coccidia stat when weaning, um, but it is just very, I think, specific to the situation and, and what's going on with those calves and everything like that. Okay, so some current deworming strategies. Um, you, so I'm gonna go through a couple of them and uh, they each kind of have some guidelines and just different ways of thinking. So for strategic deworming, which is probably one that's done the most, I would think, um, you're gonna deworm when worms are most likely to be a problem. Um, studies have shown that strategic deworming programs can provide 30 to 100 extra pounds of gain per grazing season. So that's huge. Um, it doesn't matter what the prices are, that's still huge, you know. So on years that we're barely making anything, that is definitely um, a big deal. And on years that cow-calf producers are making quite a bit whenever they sell their calves is still a big deal. Anytime you can get some extra pounds of gain, you would you want to do that. Um, your return on investment is, is great with deworming. In order to be most effective, these programs uh, should start when cattle are first turned onto the pastures to graze in the spring. 
Well, future dewormers depend on the length of persistent activity of the chosen dewormer. Um, and then the problem is it neglects year to year differences in the weather. Um, but like I say, most of the time for this particular strategy, you are going to deworm in the springtime. And then if you use a long acting dewormer, um, you may choose to deworm again, depending on what the weather's like or what's going on, even though this one says that it neglects your year differences in weather. I would say that most people are still gonna think about that. Um, but if you use a fast acting dewormer, you know, that, that goes through their system pretty quickly, um, I think a lot would just depend on your particular area and if you felt like a second deworming was needed. And is it cows or calves? And we'll talk about that. Um, there are differences when it comes to deworming them. Opportunistic deworm when you're already working cattle. Um, you know, if you're getting cattle up and you don't want to get them up again, or it's difficult to get them up again, and you're like, I already have them up, I'm going to deworm them. It doesn't matter when you're getting them up. This is kind of that school of thought. The problem is they may not need deworming when you work them. Um, say you work them, uh, you know, like in February for whatever reason, maybe on your farm, that's whenever you work them and get them up and do vaccines and things like that. That might not be the best time to deworm them here in our area. Um, so that's kind of where that's going with, um, with the problem. So suppressive strategy would be given dewormer in regular intervals or on a schedule. This is honestly how the deworming programs used to work for almost all classes of livestock. So horses were on schedule, sheep and goats were on schedules, cattle were on schedules. It, A, gets expensive, and B, we realized, we now realize that it creates resistance much faster. So we really discourage this, you know, this is every two months I deworm, you know, or every six months I deworm or, you know, whatever. It's, it's a schedule. It does not matter what the weather's doing. It doesn't matter what the cows look like. It doesn't matter if it's a brood cow or a calf. It doesn't matter. It's just a schedule. So I definitely don't recommend doing that anymore. Selective is only deworm those animals identified to have parasites through fecal egg counting or visual um, signs, like I talked about, the rough hair coat, weight loss, diarrhea, et cetera. Um, this is honestly the best strategy. However, it requires intensive management. And if you don't know how to do fecal egg counting, which not everybody does or has the equipment to do, then you've got the cost of working with a veterinarian, having fecals ran, and it's extra communication, extra stress on everybody. Um, but it, it is like a true fire thing. Like either, you know, if you do fecal egg counting, you don't necessarily deworm off of that, but it makes you more aware, more aware of what is being shed out into the environment. And are they a low or high shedder? Um, it can help you identify problem animals and then animals that are maybe shedding a lot of eggs out in the environment that could be a candidate to coal. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so preventing dewormer resistance. So this is at the top of your list. If there's anything you learn from tonight, we, we really want to hammer this um, home. So or drive this point home. Use the correct dose of dewormer. The fastest way to build resistance is to give a low dose. So with that being said, you either have to get really good at guessing the weight on your cattle or you need to invest in scales so you know the weight of your cattle being treated. Honestly, I think scales are probably one of the best investments on a cattle farm because when you deworm, you need to know weight. If you ever have to treat with antibiotics or any kind of medication, usually those are by weight. And you definitely want to make sure you get that correct. If you ever get in the, you know, if you're selling calves off your farm, whether you're selling them directly to someone or you're taking them to the stockyards or anything like that, it's so helpful to be able to track weight, know um, how they're gaining, know if there's a, any kind of issues, and then you can track that to your brood cows on their performance. So there's so much you can learn from having scales. Um, so I, again, I just think they're one of the best investments that you can make. Use porons correctly. So the main purpose for porons is internal parasite control. The more you use it to, um, hold on one second. 
the more you use it to control horn flies, the more resistance to internal parasites are becoming. So everybody's really quick to grab a bottle of poron and use it willy nilly for whatever, whether it's internal parasites, external parasites, or because you're running cattle through the chute and you feel like it's the thing to do. They are, they're, they're used incorrectly so much, um, whether the dose is wrong, um, they're not being poured on the cattle correctly, they're splashing off the cattle or they're not getting to the right location. Um, and then again, you do not want to use it as a, as a means of fly control only. That is a side benefit, but it's meant for internal parasite control. So most, so most of the time, if you are doing a spring or early summer deworming with a pour on, yes, you're going to get some benefit for external parasites and it kind of doubles up and works well. But we have such a resistance to these pour on dewormers right now, certain, certain ones, um, but they're all pretty much in the same class um, if you look at it. So be careful with that. Uh, the biggest factor is using other management practices to reduce the need for deworming. So implementing rotational grazing, not grazing below three to four inches, co-species grazing, having a really good mineral program, and body condition scoring. All that can go a long ways, um, you know, in increasing your management on the front end so that you don't have to do all these things such as doing a lot of deworming. Okay, so dewormer efficacy. So how do you know if your current deworming strategy is actually working? So, you know, you've been deworming your cattle with XYZ, you do it, you know, once, two times a year. Um, how do you know that, that everything's okay and that it's working? Maybe you visually can tell, um, but without doing something like a fecal egg count reduction test, do you really know how it's working? Um, so this you would want to work with your veterinarian on unless you know how to do fecal egg counting. Um, you would collect fecal samples on day zero and you would deworm them with the product that you've been using. And then you have your fecal egg count done, you know, preferably like that day. And that way you have a baseline for what they were like prior to the dewormer working. So you collect that fecal sample there, you, you then deworm them, you run that fecal egg count as soon as you can. You really don't want fecal samples to sit around for a while. Um, you want to cool them down and then you want to run them. Um, and then you want to bring them back up and collect fecal samples on day 14. And uh, then you'll have your fecal egg count done, you know, on this day 14, and they'll determine your percent reduction. You are looking for a 90 to 95% plus reduction to consider a dewormer effective. So unless it's reducing that egg count number, um, 90 to 95%, um, you, can, you can definitely say that it's not working like it should be working. So um, that's one way to know is my dewormer working before you start switching your strategies or switching your product. So I definitely recommend that. Here's a 2020 cost comparison of the products. I, I updated this just the other day. And when I did this, I used the same website, like the same um, company. And I used the smallest size available. So this would reflect the highest price. So if you uh, start buying bigger size bottles or things like that, then the price would start going down. Um, so for Safeguard, um, I listed the products and I listed the ingredients. Safeguard, which is a fembendazole, it's, it's the white dewormer. The cost uh, per 500 pounds on it was $2.16. Ivermec for a pour on, which is ivermectin, was $4 per 550 pounds. Generic Ivermec is like right there at a dollar. Um, long range, uh, which you have to get through a veterinarian, you cannot buy that over the counter, is about $6.61. This is probably the longest acting product on the market as far as how long it persists and lasts in the animal to get a, a really good kill over a long period of time. Um, Epronex is about $4.40. Um, Dectamax is around $3. And Side Dectum is $4.25. So you can see that even the most expensive one 
for the kind of benefit that you get from deworming, it is totally worth it. But you can see why the pour on, like especially the generic pour on here or the generic Ivamec, um, you can see why it is overused. I mean, it's just so cheap. So in comparison, you know, when you're buying something to treat 25 head or something like that, yes, the price, it seems kind of like a sticker shock, but when you do break it out per head or per 550 pounds, if you're doing calves, things like that, it, it breaks out to not be bad at all. But um, it's just hard to pass up how cheap generic Ivamec is. So that's why so many people use that. And then there's so much resistance out there. Okay, so did you know that there's 20% um, of the animals harbor 80% of the worms responsible for most of the egg output and pasture contamination? So we call this the 2080 rule. So in any given herd, 20% of your animals are um, shedding out 80% of those worm eggs out into your pasture. So that's why fecal egg counting can help um, maybe identify those high shedders, um, or it absolutely can identify those high shedders. And uh, parasite resistance is genetic. So call out these repeat offenders. Um, repeat offenders are animals that you're constantly having to deworm. And it could also mean that you don't want these high shedders, um, you know, because they're putting so many more eggs out in the environment than anybody else. So it depends on your culling program. Um, but you definitely want animals that even if they have a little bit of a worm load on them, that they are um, not showing any signs, but they're also not shedding out a whole bunch of eggs. So it is like this whole balancing act, but it's genetic. Okay, so some dewormer recommendations. Um, whenever I talk to producers, this is kind of what I go through with them. Uh, so mature cows, they may not need regular deworming, okay? Uh, you may want to select individuals that need deworming. However, you can consider deworming during the following times, um, especially if you know you've had issues in the past or if you just want to have peak performance. Um, then you could look to deworm the spring or the fall or when it's hot and dry to reduce um, that's supposed to say chance of reinfestation. So the, the deal with the spring again is with green up and grazing. Um, you would want them animals to get out there and go ahead and flush them and clean them out. For the fall, for the, fall the school of thought with the fall is we spend so much money in hay and supplementation in the winter time that you really don't want any worms in those cattle if you can help it robbing them of any kind of nutrients. So um, that's kind of the school of thought behind that is that if you deworm these brood cows prior to going into the winter, um, and most of them are gonna have calves by their side here in North Carolina, a lot of us fall calf, you know, they're gonna have better milk production, they're gonna utilize their nutrients better. Um, so there's some thought behind that. And then the hot and dry, and doing that would just, you know, uh, lower the chance of reinfestation so you get a good kill on those worms. For calves, I recommend two um, dewormings for calves to make sure they are good and cleaned out and they can gain like crazy and not have worms in the way. Uh, you wanna deworm those calves before weaning. Um, I recommend doing this with the Avermectin or a, a Bilmycin, <laughs> terrible at pronouncing these things. Um, but these are those products that are in use. They are all in the same um, category as far as chemically. Um, so if, if you find you have resistance to one of these, you're gonna have resistance to another one just because you change up the brand name or you change from Avermectin over here to this one. Um, they're still in the in the same class, if you will. But these products would include, you know, your Ivamec, your Dectamax, your Epernex, your Sidectin. Then deworm your calves at weaning, and I recommend using um, a white dewormer or Fembendazole or Albendazole at that point um, to to make sure get a good um, get a good kill on those um, worms. So when you're looking at these, you know, you want to think about, uh, you know, how long are they acting in the animal? Um, some of these are a longer acting type product, and this was a shorter acting product. Um, or I'll safeguard is Valbasin is not as far as its withdrawal time. So you do have to be conscious of that. I know I've got that on another slide, but I'm going to go ahead and mention it now. 
when you are deworming calves that you're going to be marketing or if you're deworming brood cows that um, could be sold or things like that please check the withdrawal times some of the withdrawal times are like 45 plus days on some of these products so technically you're not supposed to sell that animal until it's met its withdrawal time or paperwork is supposed to go with that animal um, if it's like a private treaty sale and you can communicate that clearly if they're going to the stockyards, um, they definitely need to meet that withdrawal period before you take them. Um, so on heifers, you want to deworm pre-breeding and mature bulls, you wanna deworm pre-breeding um, as well. The bulls, I, I definitely you know, like to say you need to deworm them once a year um, because they are so critical in their job and what you need them to do, you don't want anything getting in their way plus, while they're breeding, um, you know, they're not eating as well. They're not doing things like they normally would. So you don't, you, you want whatever they are eating and, and when they're doing that, you don't want worms interfering with that. Um, and then these yearlings can be problematic, like your replacement heifers. So that's why we say deworm those. But on these mature cows, I will say, I mean, um there's herds that haven't dewormed their mature cows in in years since they became mature you know around three four years um, of age unless they identify like a single individual and that's pretty much how i've been operating on our farm for a long time now um i don't just blanket deworm the brood cows um, because you know if they don't need it and i don't feel like they need it and i don't have issues on my particular farm um then that works well for me. So that's why you need to work with your veterinarian and determine what is gonna work best for your specific situation, how you're managing your cattle. Okay, so here are some additional dewormer thoughts. Again, make sure that you're checking your withdrawal times. That's so critical. I can't stress that enough on any product you're using, vaccines or antibiotics or dewormers, um, insecticides, anything. Make sure you check the label on your withdrawal times before you use that product at that particular time. You might need something that has a zero withdrawal. Um, or you might need someone something with um, a, um, just a you know a, a few day withdrawal, or you might be okay with it being 45 days withdrawal because of when you're giving it. Uh, consider pour-ons for mature cattle and avoid using on younger cattle, especially if you're using generic pour-on. I talked to a veterinarian about this a year or two ago, and he was like, "Yeah, definitely reserve pour-ons, and especially generic pour-ons for your mature cattle, because." Those calves are so critical. Um, they might not absorb that product well. They, you might, you know, splash a little bit of it off. You might not get the right dose. You don't want to mess up on your calves. Cows are going to be a little bit more forgiving just because they've had time to build up that immune response. Um, calves are just a much more critical deal. You want to make sure whatever you're using is going in that animal. So either something orally, um, or an injectable type product. I just don't really recommend pour-ons for, for calves. Be conscious of your dung beetles. So this is a picture of a cow patty and um, this one actually does not have any dung beetle activity or maybe just a very little bit. You can see a few little spots on it. You can actually walk around your pastures and see do I have dung beetle activity on my farm. I hope that you do because it's very important to break down manure and it also lets you know about your soil health and what you know what your management's like on your farm. If you find yourself without dung beetles, then you have to step back and look at what you're doing with your management. So if you're over deworming and especially if you're using some of these um, pour on type products or some of these certain classes of products of them like the, the ivermectins, there's um, been quite a bit shown that they have negative effects on dung beetles versus a product like Safeguard um, that is safe to use and have a good dung beetle population. And uh, you also have to think about that one with insecticides too. So any of these things that can affect, um, you know, we want them to go after some bad bugs, but unfortunately they can affect some, some good bugs. So be conscious of that. And again, don't overuse these products. Be very strategic about using those products. Consider combo deworming to improve efficacy. 
So if you're using one product and you do a fecal egg count reduction test and it comes back, you know, 80% reduction or something like that, you can combine it with another product of a different class. So say you use um, just as an example, an ivermectin injectable and it comes back 80%, you know, on the reduction test. If you combine that then with an oral paste like Safeguard, totally different class you combine together, hopefully you hit into the 90s, um, if not close to 100 on the efficacy. You know, you, you use them at the same time, just back to back. You don't ever combine anything. Um, you, just, you just use them at the same time. So uh, combo deworming is definitely something that's not new to like the sheep and goat world, but maybe new uh, to you cattle folks if you haven't heard that before. But it's definitely something that that's being looked at a little bit more to improve efficacy of these products. Do not rotate your dewormer unless you have determined through the fecal egg count reduction test that your dewormer is not working. So, uh, and, and you know, a lot of times you'll hear that folks are are rotating dewormers and they're rotating from ivermec or ivamec to cydectin. Again, it's in the same. Um, like chemical class and so you're really not rotating you have to rotate totally out of the other chemical class um, but again I would pick a product um, make a plan and you know until that product quits working don't worry about doing any kind of rotating or you rotating from this brand of that brand or you know this class of that class until you know that it's not working anymore because that can increase resistance if you expose those bugs to a bunch of different um, dewormers, which we mainly only have two, I think it's only two chemical classes or it might be another one that I'm missing, but we're very limited on our dewormers, um, but not as delimited, not as uh, limited <laughs> as the sheep and goat folks, thank goodness, it's, it's horrible for them. I really feel for them. Okay, so we're gonna to totally switch gears here. And again, as you think of questions, just put them in the chat window and we'll have a little Q&A at the end. Um, external parasites, so we're gonna talk about lice and ticks, warble, warbles. Um, I don't think I'm gonna talk on that one because it's no longer a major concern, but you might see it out there. It's known as grubs. I know I haven't had any dealings with it here. Um, it's not really an issue here. And again, no longer a major concern. For flies, we're gonna look at horn flies and the face flies. Uh, with lice, this is a common problem in late winter and you can easily identify it. I'll show you some pictures in just a moment. It will affect young and old cattle. It does not discriminate. Um, they will have loss in body condition and milk production. The clinical signs, severe itching, mainly around the neck and the tail head, and they'll have hair loss. So again, it's really easy to spot. The entire life cycle is spent on the host. It does make it easier to control. And all products kill larvae in adult stages, but not the egg stage. So you treat twice within two weeks or use a product that persists longer than two weeks. And the lice problem usually clears up as temperatures rise. Um, so a lot depends on, you know, how, how bad is the problem? Can you get the cattle up at that moment? Um, how close are you to temperatures increasing, things like that. But this is what it looks like. You'll see these little, every single winter I will get questions about this from a cattle producer. Just want to know what's going on because you can easily recognize or you can easily see that something's wrong, but you don't know what. Um, they, uh, they'll lose the hair there on the sides of their neck and again on their tail head. Another thing though, not to get confused with, if you're using hay rings to feed hay, they might lose hair on the top of their necks from putting their, especially on the brood cows from eating hay. So that's not to be confused with this. This is gonna usually be down on the side um, like it is here in that calf. But if you get them up closer, you can definitely see the lice on those animals. Okay, so I have to definitely mention ticks right now because we have a major problem here in North Carolina, um, or it could become a major problem. The Asian longhorn tick is now in North Carolina. It is invasive. Um, it was first introduced to the U.S. in 2010. It's from China, Japan, Korea. The biggest issue with this thing is these females can produce 900 to 3,300 eggs with or without a male. It is so scary that they can produce this many um, offspring. 
So all life stages can be found on host animals or in the environment. There can be just major heavy infestations. They can cause severe blood loss, poor growth and development and transmit disease to animals. So think about something like anaplasmosis, which is definitely uh, an issue in this state. Um, so you want to make sure that you're not leaving out tick control with your external parasite management plan. Make sure you're using a product. Make sure you're checking animals when you get them up. Um, do they have ticks on them? And um, we actually had a case last year in this state where some cattle died because they were so heavily infested with this tick. So I have linked up um, our fact page on this tick that when I send these handouts, you can click it and you can go there and read more. If you think you have an Asian longhorn tick, you can collect a specimen and work with your extension agent. Um, we're a great resource. We can send that off to have it positively identified and work with you on a plan. Um, so that's definitely my plug tonight. If you're not working with your livestock agent, um, make sure you get to know them. They're a great resource for you. Um, wherever you are. Um, extension is almost everywhere. Okay, um, so the horn fly is gonna rest on the horns of cattle. If they are pulled, it's gonna rest on the withers, the backside and the underside where biting occurs. And um, they're active early spring, early spring through the first frost in the fall, which most everybody knows that that's pretty much how the fly life cycle works. Unless we have a mild winter, um, we can definitely see flies earlier and later and things like that. But that's typically the, the fly life cycle that we're gonna see here in North Carolina. They are easier to control because they stay on the animal most of the time. Losses will begin when there are 200 to 250 flies. If cattle, young or old, have this many flies, treatment will result in weight gain. Um, I meant to add a photo of what 200 to 250 flies looks like. If you Google it, there's, um, and I'll try to put it in actually in your handouts, but it shows some pictures at different stages so you can kind of see if it's this size of a group of flies. Oh, that, that's probably around 200, I need to do something. So I'll make sure that that's included in your handouts. A uh, study from Texas A&M showed that wean calves gain uh, increased 20, 27 pounds on average when effective control of horn flies is implemented. So again, this is just on horn flies. You know, this is an add if you do correct deworming, um, if you're controlling for the other parasites, this is just horn flies. So I did this off of our current market, five weight calves are bringing, whenever I looked this up, I think it was last week, $1.37 a pound. So that could result to 27 to $37 increased profit per calf. On a normal year and a much better year, that's gonna result in a lot more money. You're talking probably 50 to $100 in profit per calf, depending on where the market's at. So that's huge. So even in a poor market, it's still worth it. It's still profitable. Okay, so for the face fly, it's larger and more robust than the horn fly. It prefers to be on the face and consumes secretion from the eyes and nostril. Um, and merges mid spring and stays active all year. It's harder con to control because it does not stay on the animal all the time. And it is the culprit that transmits um, a pink eye organism from animal to animal. Um, what it does is it'll damage the cornea allowing the pink eye causing organism to gain access. So whenever I talk about preventing pink eye, one of my first things is going to be you have got to have a really good fly control program. You have to. Um, and then beyond that, you want to make sure that you don't have really tall seed heads that could be scratching open the eyes of the cattle, you wanna make sure that you have shade available um, and you wanna reduce dust. So if you've got them up in lots and things like that, you wanna reduce dust because that can cause eye to be irritated. Um, but fly control is huge. Whenever I see cattle that have tons of fly on their face and on their faces, it just makes me cringe because you're just asking for a pink eye problem. All right, so here's some photos. This is the horn fly 
this is the face fly. I am not an entomologist to tell y'all what are all the differences and, and, and everything like that. Um, but these are some good images of them. The biggest thing is just knowing where they're at on your cows and then you'll know, well, what problem do I have? The face flies are just going to be all over their little nose and around their eyes and on their face. And then the horn flies on this polled cow, they're going to be right there on the withers area and then on the belly. And man, they come in swarms. Um, but I would be more worried about these guys than these, but both are a huge concern. Okay, so for external parasite control, there's two major classes of chemicals, the pyrethrins and the orga organophosphates. There's several different application methods available. So you got fly tags, porons, back rubs, spray applicators, bullet rubs, hand sprayers, feed throughs, um, and a few other things that have been added. There's now fly strips. I think I got a picture of it that you can add on mineral feeders. Um, so we're definitely getting creative on ways to do this without having to get cattle up. And I think that's the name of the game on, um, you know, doing this and feeling like you can implement it all summer long. It's really hard getting cattle up multiple times. And um, that's why I don't love fly tags. You've got to get those fly tags in at the appropriate time. And fly tags only need to be in three months and you got to get cattle back up and get them back out. So to me, I think fly tags are just really aggravating. And then you've also got to put another hole in their ear if you don't, um, you know, and if you already have two tags in their ear, now you've got to do two more tags and now they got four tags. <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things. Um, it's sort of his personal preference on what you want to deal with. The porons are great. There are actual insecticide porons that, you know, it's just like how you do a poron dewormer, but it's just for fly control. Um, and you just uh, measure out the dose and you pour it down the back of the animal. And some of them say you can pour like down the neck and maybe a little bit on the top of their head. So you have to read the instructions. Back rubs are really popular. The biggest thing with back rubs that I see is people not keeping them charged. You have to keep them charged. Um, you want it putting out a high dose all the time. And to do that, it has to stay charged. So uh, here's a little pro tip for you. Um, you can actually clean out a laundry detergent bottle, uh, rinse it out really, really well, and you can mix your solution in there. You can buy a ready to use solution and you take that and leave your back rag, ugh, leave your back rub up where it's hung up at and you can take that and you can easily pour your solution onto that back rub for it to absorb instead of having to get your back rub down and soaking it in a giant tub or something like that, which is super aggravating. Um, the spray applicators, so uh, just getting like a one gallon, two gallon pump sprayer or backpack sprayer, you can mix an insecticide with water. So again, read the label because a lot of these insecticides, if you buy them, they can go a couple of different ways. They can go on rubs, they can be sprayed out. And what you can do is um, there's little foggers actually that you can put on like four wheelers or side by sides and you can actually circle the group of cows and they'll fog it out or you can have cattle up eating and you can spray it on them while they're eating. Um, you can get them up and just, you know, um, let them walk out of the chute. You don't even have to stop them in there because you can just spray as they're walking through. Um, that's definitely effective. But again, on some of these, you have to do them quite frequently. So that's why I say it's probably a good idea to do a couple of different of uh, fly control options to get the best control possible. Those bullet rubs that go on the mineral feeders, those things are excellent because they are going to that mineral feeder every day. So if you do one of these back rubs, you wanna make sure you put it in a common area or where they have to go get water or some way to make them go through it. But with the mineral feeders, those little um, bullets that hang down, uh, they are definitely gonna target face flies. So you also have to think about that. The back rubs can help target all the flies that you're, um, that you're wanting to control if you get the right product. But with it being on the mineral feeders, it's gonna give their face a good dose. But to me, that's like huge. I definitely wanna reduce face flies. Uh, the hand sprayers, I talked about that. Um, there's feed throughs, so you can actually break up the fly cycle by feeding some of these feed throughs, 
which will prevent um, the eggs from hatching, the flags from hatching in the manure. The thing about feeding these, like most time, most time you've heard them as fly control minerals, but there are additives that you can that you can add into. Um, I want to say the additives you can either add to your feed or add to your minerals yourself. Some of these can be bought pre-mixed. But the thing with them is you've got to start them before the fly threshold begins. So uh, for here in North Carolina, you would have wanted to start them back in like March, April timeframe if you're doing these feed through minerals, um, these fly control minerals, and then you want to keep feeding the fly control minerals all the way through the first, um, or I'd say more of a hard killing frost. And then you can switch off of the fly control minerals and you cannot let it run out. If you let it run out, then everything you've been working hard to achieve goes away. Um, okay. So here's kind of some control, control strategies around fly control. And I will give y'all this mode of action sheet. So you want to select a different insecticide mode of action within the season or between years following um, a six year system. So this is from our entomologist, Dr. Um, Wes Watson. He put this together and it's really helpful to minimize uh, resistance with these products and to make sure that they're working correctly. Again, ear tag should be put in after the horn fly numbers reach 200 flies per animals and the ear tags should be cut out you know, in September, October. The threshold for us on that 200 flies per animal is usually reached in May uh, for the Piedmont. So here's just like an example. So for a May, you can do a pour on using this class. So that would mean uh, the dewormer class. So again, this is a time where uh, we are usually, de most of the time people are deworming that time. So that works as you were your fly control for May as well. Again, it's a side benefit to using that. You could change that out for this particular example and just use a pour on insecticide. But then for June, July, and August, you would use a pyrethroid fly air tag like Sabre or Python or the trade names. And that's your three months with air tags. Then you would come back in September and do a fall treatment again like i had talked about a spring and fall treatment with dewormer and then the side benefit with this is your um with your fly control so with year two you would want to switch out your fly ear tags and go with an organophosphate dust bag such as cobra exam for example um, and the sheet i'll give you gives you several different scenarios as to how to change out products and all of them are going to work with two different products so just for example, like on our farm, I do multiple things every single year. Um, I do change some things out um, as far as like what products being used, but I usually look about using um, some sort of rub, some sort of either pour on or spray, and then um, fly control minerals. And that's kind of the things that I rotate through that work really well. Okay, so here's some pictures of what I've been talking about. These are the little uh, bullets and there they are on a mineral feeder. This is a creep feeder. That's another great place to put them. These are the, the back rubs and this is the mineral feeder. So they've kind of created a little area that they have to walk through them to get to the mineral feeder. This is just that backpack sprayer where you can mix up your insecticide and spray them as they go through the chute there. Um, this is a dust bag and so you just charge that and as they walk through it, it's going to put out that product. Um, so it really doesn't, you want to have a, you want to have different modes of action, different chemical classes, but you also want to have different ways that stuff is going out on these animals because some things are, um, they put out low doses through a long period of time, like an ear tag, and then some things are high dose. Um, whenever you do them or however you keep them charged like the bullets. This is going to be a high dose anytime that you do it and you've got to read the label and how frequently do you need to do that for it to be effective. Um, these are the little strips I was talking about. So these are little insecticide strips that go on these mineral feeders now and now they've actually made these really cool add-ons to ear tags again my whole issue with those ear tags not only is there a lot of resistance using 
some of these fly ear tags because they're not used correctly. Um, but you have to you have to get them up twice and you've got all these holes in their ear. Well, this one, you just um, snap it on the back of the ear tag. So this is the back of the ear, back of the ear tag, and it just slides right on. So that's really cool. If you've got a two ear, ta ear tag system on your cows, that works well because most mature cows have to have two strips um, per mature animal and usually calves. And that's the same with um, the fly ear tags as well. This is one of the poron insecticides I was talking about, silence. Um, you just squeeze it up into here, read the dosage amount, and you pour along their back. And now they've came out with all these really cool rubs um, where cows come up, and this is kind of like a one-stop shop. There's um, this part right here is actually charged to where when they rub on it, it's going to put an insecticide on them. And then I don't know if that brush releases insecticide or not, but they'll come and scratch on the brush. And then they've got their minerals over here and they've got another thing that's probably putting out insecticide. So there's all these products are already made that you can get to help you implement your uh, fly control or you can just be creative and you can make quite a few things or use stuff that you already have. So some of the factors to consider when developing a fly control program for your herd, um, prioritize your young cattle, don't leave them out um, because they are growing, decreases in gain affect income directly. Young cattle are just much more susceptible to all these things because they have not developed an immune response. So think about pink eye. Full season control from fly tags, especially for face flies, is generally not possible. So the horn flies, um, developed resistance to the original pyrethroid ear tags quite rapidly. We do have some new ear tags out in the market that are definitely better um, as far as how, how effective that they are. But if you haven't used ear tags on your farm or you, use, you have used them sparingly and you've used them correctly, they probably are still doing a good job. I know we've only used them like once or twice on our farm, so I'm probably going to cycle them back through here soon. I like the little strips. I think I'm going to try that on our farm next. Um, but as long as you're using these products responsibly and you're rotating the chemical classes and you're rotating what you're doing, they can work for you for a really long time. Um, dust bags, oilers, face mops, and other self-medicators can be effective because they provide long-term high concentrations of insecticide on the cattle, but you gotta make sure you locate them in the right spot and also that you keep them charged with insecticide. Okay, so I know we're kind of approaching an hour here. I'm gonna go through this um, and that'll be the end of the presentation. So the research studies in North Carolina, I think you'll find this really, really interesting. This was a fecal egg count reduction study that was conducted in North Carolina during uh, 2006 and 2007 at two different locations. So the upper Piedmont Research Station at Reedsville and the Center for Environmental Farming Systems at Goldsboro. The calves were dewormed at weaning with various products and compared to untreated controls and parasitology labs were also compared. So at the Upper Piedmont Research Station, to give you a little bit of background, um, this is in Reedsville. This is a registered Angus herd at the time and long-term exclusive use of ivermectin. They've been using it for 30 plus years. They calve in December and wean in July. For the um, Center for Environmental Farming Systems, we also call that SEVS. In Goldsboro, they have a commercial Angus and Angus Cinepole cows. No deworming for mature, of mature cows for 15 years. They recently, um, only when significant fecal egg counts were determined twice in the five years preceding these studies. So they were probably trying to do everything they could on the management side and stay away from chemical use of dewormers as much as they could and see how those cows were doing. I'm not 100% sure as to why they didn't deworm their cows for 15 years, but that just kind of gives you a little bit of framework um, for that particular um, research farm. I'm sure there was a reason for it though. Um, calving in February and weaning in uh, September. So the general study protocol, fecal samples were taken seven to 10 days before treatment for allotment to treatment at weaning. Allotment was based on weight, sex, and initial count. Then samples were again taken at the time of treatment and then again 14 days later, like I had described to y'all early on. You, you take uh, samples day zero and then um, day 14. Calves were weighed before treatment. Dosages were calculated to the nearest 0.1 milliliter. 
calves receiving poron were housed separate from other calves. All labs uh, were blind to treatment. Okay, so here's the efficacy of dewormers at the Upper Piedmont Research Station. Remember, they used the ivermectin for like 30 plus years. Um, so this is a study in 2006, study in 2007. Um, for the generic poron, they only had um, about a 60% or so uh, reduction. Then with the Ivamec poron, this bar right here, um, they saw what about 75 to 80% or so percent re um, reduction. The um, injectable Ivamec, which is, let's see, right here, and I'm not sure where, why it's not on that side. I just now noticed that. Well, anyways, it was around 60% uh, reduction. And then with the safeguard drench, which is the SG, um, they saw 100% reduction on safeguard. And, you know, again, those cattle had probably not seen safeguard. Safeguard is a whole different chemical class and the way that it works is different. It's a short um, acting versus long acting. And, you know, I've seen a lot of research studies that show that safeguard is very effective in cattle. It's not effective in other classes of livestock like it is cattle. Um, and I think that's because it's just not used that much. And, um, it, again, it's a whole different chemical class than what we normally use. So that was, um, that was good to see. Okay, so for the upper Piedmont percent reduction, um, you can see here with uh, the injectable Ivamex, 59%, the Portland Ivamex was 79%, Safeguard was 100%, Generic poron was 73% um, as related to the control. Okay, so um, this is, uh, let's see, let's go back. That was, okay, so that was the wean calves. Count reduction, yeah, okay. So this is at Seth's and Goldsboro on their wean calves. And again, they, they actually had, a much higher response on their percent reduction. So that'll just show you how things will vary from location to location um, based on your area, based on your management and things like that. And um, this was for 2008. Again, they um, saw much higher percent reduction than the other location did. Again, Safeguard hit that 100%. So the conclusions, ivermectin was generally not as effective at Upper Piedmont, but was at the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. Um, the lack of efficacy appears to be related to a shift of the parasite population to cuperia. Fenbendazole is highly effective at reducing fecal egg counts 14 days post-treatment. All dewormers should be used sparingly and efficacy of specific chemistries will be site-specific. Other findings, um, variability between labs. Um, and variability between calves. So calf number one, which is on your right, um, had 1,100 eggs uh, per three grams. Nine days later, had 175 eggs per three grams. The calf on the left here um, had zero eggs, and then nine days later had one egg. And you, that's why these fecal egg counts are so important in these reduction tests, because you would not you would not be able to tell that from looking at these two calves. It's just so important to know what is actually going on. Um, okay, so the key take home points, you cannot have 100% control all the time. Every time you deworm, you risk a resistance. Um, best management practices are key to manage internal and external parasites. Always, always follow the label and use the correct dose. All right, so with that, I'm going to go to the chat window and see what's going on. Okay, so um, Claire said, are weight tape measurements accurate enough? Um, I don't know of any weight tape. Well, I do know of weight tapes for cattle, and they're mainly used for calves. I don't, you know, if, are you talking about with using them with mature cattle? Claire, if you'll type in the chat window. And April's on here. She's a livestock agent for Scythe County. So April, you might have to help me with this. But 
I am not really familiar with using weight tapes on mature animals for cattle. Um, okay, so Claire said dual purpose, so I measure an average beef and dairy. I would assume that it would um, be fine, but I don't know that those weight tapes go up high enough for mature animals. And again, you're going to have to, um, and it, it is an estimate. It's not going to be an actual, like as if you were weighing them on a scale, but it's better than nothing. Um, and it's definitely better than you just trying to guess. So if you've got that and it goes up high enough and you use it correctly, I would say that's, that's better than guessing and doing nothing. Um, April, do you have any comment to that? If you're still on here? Um, just like you said, you know, scales would definitely be a better option. And there are some counties that do have um, portable scales that we can get access to. Yes, so I keep forgetting about that. Absolutely. Yeah, depending on what county you're in. Um, I know right now Alamance County doesn't have any, but maybe we can get some in the future. Um, I know I think Chatham and Randolph do, and I feel like some of the other counties nearby do as well. But you could check those out absolutely when you're working cattle or if you just want to get weights on your cattle you could for sure um and that would definitely be a better option um angela ask honey ask we have microscopes in my office i'm happy to do um fecal egg counts for you um i'm better at the sheep um fecal egg counts, but we can definitely try the beef cattle. Okay, yeah, and I'll talk about that here in just a minute. Um, so I had somebody ask, would you discuss about the drug of choice for the treatment of coccidiosis in calves? Um, I think it's Corid is probably the main one that's like over the counter that you can get. Um, again, you would want to work with your veterinarian just to make sure that that is actually the problem. They're going to run a fecal on that animal, look for those coccidia eggs and, um, and go with you there on a treatment and they might take you a different route. Um, but that's probably the most used coccidia stat as far as like, um, or treating coccidiosis that I know that's like over the counter readily available. You can feed, um, again, like I mentioned, a medicated feed um, with a coccidia stat in it to prevent it, but I think you can also feed through to treat it as well, or you can do like a drench. So there's a couple of different things and a couple of different products out there. Um, just ask your veterinarian about, about those products. Uh, Claire said best fly controls for animals like show or working cattle that'll be handled all over by humans every day. Um, Claire, I wanted to ask, are you rinsing every day? Are you rinsing the calves? Like, are you washing them every day is what she's asking. Washing and rinsing. No, not washing, just grooming and working. Um, I would think any of, the pro any of the products would be fine in that circumstance. The issue comes into play with if you are, if you're washing them with water, you're gonna, you're gonna be washing that product right off. Um, but you're gonna, they're gonna have to have some kind of product on them um, as far as some sort of insecticide to help control those flies. So I would say, though, that, you know, if you, I'm trying to think, April, you're probably going to help me out, but, you know, ear tags are probably going to be a really good option just because that's not going to be something like actually on the animal's fur or something like that. Um, if you do pour ons or something, the day that you do that, you would not want to mess with the animals until it's absorbed. Same thing goes with the sprays you might want to stay away from using rubs because they're going to do that like every day and it's going to be uh, if you use like mineral oil things like that it's going to be kind of oily if you're touching and brushing on the animal so i don't know april do you want to add something to that to that i'm sorry i'm wearing you out tonight <laughs> helping oh you're good that's fine um so yeah i mean 
we have used um, silence and some poor ohms even on our show cattle, but like you said, the ones that we're showing and rinsing, um, that's not really a good option. Um, so we are using a new mineral that has cinnamon and garlic. Oh yeah, the mineral, yeah. Um, yeah, so the so mineral's a great option for ones that you're working often and don't have to worry about. Yeah. Off. Um, or a type of block, like if your cattle are used to blocks, um, there's blocks that you can put out or tubs that are treated for fly control. I forgot to mention that. There's tons of feed throughs available depending on how, yeah. you, how you feed your animals. You know, Just to get don't let them run out of it. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, so there's minerals, there's options for adding into actual feed or buying feed that's already got them. I think it's April, help me out. So for fly control for feed through with feed, it's already pre put into the feed. I'm trying to think it's, is it it's an additive or is it already pre-mixed so you can get both okay. um so our our mineral has it already in it and we're feeding it free choice um you can buy some feeds that have something like clarify mixed in with that's what i was thinking about yeah yeah and it's or a little you bit can... more expensive but we used clarify last year um, on our hogs and it was a great option for the hogs Okay. We're just being two, so not a big deal. Yeah, so definitely a couple different ways to go about that. Um, but okay. Michelle and Claire, I mean, it sounds like you're both able to get really close to your animals. And I mean, if the horse fly spray um, or the permethrins, you know, are working, then, you know, that, I mean, that's a, a good option. Mm -hmm. um, so okay. Angela did ask, did you have Sorry, let me else? add one more thing. Okay. Um, we do use a pesticide company to treat our house and he did hang some um fly baits yeah i didn't even mention those things that you can do around your barn and stuff and traps but that you can most have. of those are attractants and so it attracts the flies so don't put them where you are standing every single day <laughs> i've seen some really cool homemade um type traps that are put out in barnyard areas and they don't have like any chemical base to them at all. It's all about design and, and things like that. So I'll try to dig up some of that info to share with y'all, but they, they tend to work well. And another thing I meant to put a video in or a picture in to show y'all on these or uh, like some of the organic farms, especially dairy farms where they're, uh, what they're able to do for fly control is really minimal. There have been fly vacuums developed. It's definitely not cost effective for everybody to have one or I would have one, but as the cows are like come to the milking parlor, that sort of thing, they walk through this fly vacuum and it literally sucks the flies off of them. It's the coolest thing ever. So there's definitely some ways to do some fly control without having to use insecticides or put things on the animals. Um, but uh, you definitely think about treating you know, are having these things around the barn area. Um, but yeah, baits or fly strips or these other things that you can hang up that would help also reduce, especially if you have show animals or animals you're bringing up all the time or animals up in confinement. Um, Angela said, could the extension consider offering a fecal egg count class for cattle and sheep? It's super expensive to have a vet do it, have a microscope here, but don't know how to do it. So, um, it depends on your extension office, whether or not the livestock agent is set up or has the knowledge to be able to help you with that. There's some of us that do. So um, like April mentioned, she does. I know I do. I've taught classes now for um, small ruminants and equine owners. So my next target will be for cattle owners because it is a little bit different for each species, like how you're collecting samples and what you're looking for and what are the thresholds and how do you manage parasites. So be looking for that from me in the future. But um, I know in the Alamance office, if I'm working with you and we have a working relationship and I know what your parasite management plan is and things like that, I can help run samples. I can help teach you how to run samples. I can talk to you about the equipment, all that good stuff. And I can work with you one-on-one. -on -one. And so some of the offices are set up like that. So just reach out to your extension office, um, you know, and, and just see what, what they're able to do. It's, it is few and far between, I'm going to say that, but any of us that offer a class typically open it up to anybody that can come. Um, so thank you for putting that in there because that's definitely on my to-do list in the future. 
Okay, so Michelle said we are looking for better ways to control flies on the cattle legs. We're currently spraying with permethrins. That's probably the best thing you can do because a lot of rubs don't directly get onto the legs. Um, Porons are not going to get down to the legs, so you're probably going to have to do a spray. If you have not used the fly control minerals or one of the feed throughs, you might want to consider doing that because again, it helps break up that life cycle. So it's going to have an impact all over the animal. It's going to reduce the flies in the environment. Um, but if you're actually wanting a product to put directly on the legs, I'd say the spray is going to be your best bet. Okay. Um, I think that that's it. Oh, here we go. Another one. <laughs> it would be nice to attend a class on how to do a fecal egg count with a microscope. Yes. So like I say, I've taught two of those classes now. I have a microscope and a microscope camera so I can put up on the big screen what I'm looking at. I can walk you through all that. I will make sure you guys get the link to my video. I have a video that walks you through how to do fecal egg counting and what equipment is needed along with the handout. So if you just need to like brush up on your skills, you've got the stuff and, and that sort of thing, that video will help you or it'll just kind of get you prepared to attend a class or to know what questions to ask or how to get your equipment prepared. So I do have that. It is on YouTube, um, walks you through doing the modified McMaster's um, fecal egg count technique. Okay, cool. So it looks like everybody would be interested in that. That's awesome. Make sure y'all put that on your evaluation pre please and that'll help remind me um, and maybe uh, we'll work with a couple of extension agents and and get that done for this area. Okay, are there any other questions. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, I really appreciate y'all getting on tonight, spending your uh, evening with me. I hope you learned quite a bit about internal and external parasites. Be looking for that email from me with some resources and that evaluation link. Thank y'all so much. Have a great night.